Uh, now uh, we'll like to hand over to uh, Holger, uh, Holger Schneider from the DFS, who is the uh, who is an ATC supervisor, but also a flow supervisor at Rain uh, Rider in Karlsruhe. So, please, Holger. That's right. Uh, so, thank you very much. Please forward. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, especially thank you very much for the opportunity to give you an insight into our operations last year, and probably a little bit of an impression of uh, what is to come in, in the coming year. So, um, as um, Ken already said, I'm um, operational supervisor in Karlsruhe, so this is an uh, account from the sharp end of the picture. And um, I'm also tasked with uh, special duties in uh, flow management and um, uh, in connection with the uh, flight management position and the flight management assistant at Karlsruhe. So um, the Karlsruhe preconditions for 2018 were pretty clear. We, and, and we clearly communicated it from the start on. We had some experience in this because the year before was the same situation. Um, that we will not be able to offer the required capacity to deal with the planned demand. Um, um, every effort was taken to mitigate the impact. Um, to name only a few, we increased the um, amount of ab initio at coast uh, to the maximum extent. This means uh, we increased the capacity our academy can train trainees to the maximum extent, also uh, the capacity to uh, which we can locally train controllers as well to the maximum. But uh, as everybody knows, uh, this is not a measure that uh, already kicks in uh, in 2019. It would take some time to train a controller to, to bring him to in a, into a position where we can yeah, fully make use of his uh, working power. So um, this was done and successfully done. The recruitment of ready entry echoes from all over the world. We had some experience in this as well from a couple of years ago when we introduced our new system and got into staffing issues as well. So uh, we spread the word around in the world that uh, we would uh, be interested in uh, echoes from other nations who would be interested in coming to Germany. Um, being already, having already some experience in uh, air traffic control and uh, so we uh, just could them train we could just train them locally and don't have to put them through the uh, institutional training uh, we succeeded in this as well this is an on ongoing process we are still expecting uh, some colleagues to arrive at Karlsruhe um, reduction of uh, special tasks of operational staff to the minimum extent um, this is uh, uh, a measure where you can feel the impact um, immediately um, Especially, I mean, you have the guys in the ops room. This is a positive aspect. Another negative aspect is that um, they, they, you need their experience uh, when you develop uh, other things. And uh, it's uh, sometimes not very easy to find the balance. Um, implementation of software tools to ease the workload. Uh, I mean, sometimes for people coming to the ops room, it's, uh, it's amazing for them to see how large the amount of manual work is. And so we identified a couple of things uh, where we can uh, implement software tools uh, to ease the workload a little bit, which makes life easier. And um, clear and open constructive communication with NM, with the AOs and ANSPs, um, to be able to prepare for the situation was very, very important for us because we would not try, the, try to give the impression that everything is fine or we can deal with the situation. We have uh, measures to mitigate. No, we would like to, to put everything on the table and uh, as early as possible find uh, um, solutions that in the end uh, worked as well. And um, I mean, as bad as the situation was, I must say, uh, in hindsight or looking into the future as well that um, the, a, a positive outcome is that uh, now we started to communicate with each other with the AO community and other ANSPs and especially with NM I think this is a very very good outcome of all this um, and then contributing to the RAT package summer 2018 was another measure uh, where we participated in and uh, there are many other things, minor things uh, probably, um, but um, they might have made a, a um, difference on uh, occasional days, what uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, this uh, flight, which could have been taken out of a certain measure just, to, uh, just to, to save some money or to make operations a little easier. So um, 
for the whole uh, stuffing planning for the whole year, we try to shift available stuff as much as possible towards the summer period and uh, taking uh, as much as possible stuff out of the dark uh, uh, months of the year, January, February, March. Um, we accepted that we would uh, generate uh, with this uh, behavior already in the usually quiet period of the year, but um, we expect that the ov overall impact to be much smaller. I mean, we needed them in the summertime when we had adverse weather situations and uh, issues with night curfew and shifting traffic towards the night. So as we did not uh, live through the other option, we thought uh, we really succeeded in this as well. And uh, 2017 operations faced us already with a significant wear out effect of operational stuff. I mean, when you're working throughout a busy and uh, um, demanding summer, then um, you experience or we experienced an increase of the dropout rate due to medical reasons towards the end of the summer, August 2017 or June, August, September 2017 uh, uh, really hit us hard. This had a very negative impact on the uh, delay statistics, on the expected delay, and we really wanted to avoid this situation for 2018. Um, and we succeeded in this as well. And uh, the root cause for this was that there uh, was a change in the um, possibilities we had to assign uh, overtime to the controllers, but also that we were um, much more aware uh, or much more protective towards the controllers uh, concerning difficult traffic situations. Let's put it this way, not to, not to say overload situations. Um, so this uh, worked as well um, in 2018. And uh, a very important thing, and I will come back to this uh, um, later, is the experience from 2017 showed that every effort must be taken to stabilize the traffic situation and the traffic prediction, because, I mean, this is what we are planning for. This is where we put our stuff in, and uh, if the plan in the end does not work, then uh, the disruption is, uh, is coming, and you can't do anything against this. But measures, instead of daily changing a difficult to coordinate ATFCM scenarios, uh, for our um, operations, uh, it's much easier with RAT measures and much more plannable than day-to-day uh, -day changing uh, ATFCM scenarios where nobody really knows what is coming. And uh, strongly supporting the idea of sector adherence. This is the term we are now, we now like to use instead of flight uh, plan, flight level adherence, because, and I will come to this uh, um, later in the presentation as well, um, it's not so much important uh, for us uh, to make a certain flight fly at the exact uh, level he, was, he filed in the flight plan, but much more important to make him appear in the um, sector where he, he has been planned for so that our capacity planning and our staffing planning sector opening scheme and all these things, uh, they really work in the end. So, and uh, then the European Multi-ANSB Initiative, uh, initially named for ACC, but then later was changed because uh, many other are involved in this as well. Led by an M, agreed in a very constructive and cooperative way to a general RAT scheme. Um, designed in the idea of giving the best overall solution for the whole network instead of planning for individual interests uh, was uh, put into operation in the last year and will be in 2019 this year as well. But uh, for, one, for the first time, I think, a really um, systematic approach where everybody was involved and uh, in the interest of the whole network started, and this uh, was where we contributed as well. So with all this taken together, the plan to, for 2018 was made, everything was put into place, and I think now it's time to have a look at uh, the actual operations. So we struggled with two major issues in 2018, and actually we still do and expect this to continue in the coming months as well. One thing is weather, this is uh, not very surprising, and the other thing is stability and reliability of traffic prediction. Uh, first point, weather. The thunder, thunderstorm period started very early in 2018, which made us a bit nervous what would be the expectancy for the rest of the year. A significant number of very dynamic CB cell development covering the whole area with a lot of movement. Many different sectors were involved and uh, very difficult predictability concerning questions like when, where, and the vertical extensions and severity. And these are the uh, main important parameters or the most important parameters for us when uh, initiating a regulation. 
I mean, we have been um, on a couple of uh, weather meetings and um, there were a lot of ideas about what can be done. And when you talk to the experts, to the, to the scientists and to the, to, to the meteorologists, um, a lot of things seem to be possible today. But in the end, when you boil it down to what is necessary in the ops room to make uh, decisions, then it comes down to when will it come, where will it come, what's the vertical extension and what's the severity. Probably. I'm not sure if it's safe to say, but uh, the, the difficulty that we are having in upper airspace or in the en route uh, um, area is uh, probably a bit um, more significant than in the airport. I mean, not to, I, I don't mean that uh, the, this problem does not exist there, but um, when, you, when you know that uh, tomorrow uh, adverse weather will appear, then you know it will hit your airport uh, and you can probably prepare more or less for the situation. But um, with an airspace which covers uh, more or less the whole of Germany with a lot, with a um, uh, significant vertical extension, yeah, where do you lo would, you, would you like to put on measures? Which sector, um, how hard, uh, which uh, number to regulate do you do it uh, pre-tactically already and the weather is not coming? These are the important questions that need to be asked, uh, answered and those questions need to be answered for the operational stuff on the day of operation. Um, nearly all those days had one thing in common, and this proves my point I just made. So they were very different from what the weather forecast predicted, and even a short period in advance. So we very often had the situation, you, are, you know something is coming, you see on the weather screen that uh, something is building up, you are calling the uh, colleague in the, in the Met office, uh, you're asking for what is going to happen, and they say one thing, 10 minutes later, you find yourself in a completely different situation and uh, the, which has nothing to do with uh, what, you, what you got. So um, this is a problem that we are having. And uh, finally then, we participated in these uh, cross-border weather trials. Uh, if it's the cross-border weather trial initiated by NM or if it's uh, the Alpine weather trial, a special um, uh, operating scheme that we um, did with our neighbors in the Alpine area, to, uh, to uh, tackle a certain problem that we are having there concerning Frankfurt inbounds and I don't want to go, or, I'm sorry, Munich inbounds, I don't want to go too much into detail. So in general, I would like to say the major issue uh, with weather for us, probably for the other ANSPs as well, is the lack of a reliable forecast tailored to the needs of the operational requirements. P please keep in mind these uh, questions that I just uh, asked, uh, when, where, severity, um, Cross-border coordination initiated by a designated authority with a view on the whole network can give more essential information like first-hand experience and will improve planability in those situations. <coughs> so I think uh, there is a lack of uh, cross-border uh, coordination right now. We can pr uh, um, have an advantage from the experience that is made probably further west from our airspace or further east depending on where the weather is coming from and we don't have to sit there uh, watching the screen and uh, just waiting for things to happen. Probably with a more systematic approach, we could get already information from our neighbors and um, to, yeah, to have a better feeling for what is coming. And there's always, and this is a, a matter in all discussions that I've joined, the discrepancy between early action, which is good for planability, and the too restrictive behavior, which causes unnecessary delay. So imagine um, we, uh, very often in these cross-border uh, weather discussions, we hear about uh, uh, pre-tactical regulations, and I must say, until... Um, somebody um, convinces me uh, otherwise, I, I cannot imagine to put on for Karlsruhe pre-tactical weather regulations because uh, what happens in the real tactical situation is always very, very difficult, different from what the, from what the prediction um, says. And uh, you, you don't want us to put on pre-tactical regulations uh, um, and already uh, generating delay for situations that will not materialize. So this was uh, everything about weather. And uh, the, another very, very serious problem that we are having and uh, many others as well is the traffic prediction, stability and reliability of the traffic prediction. Because the traffic prediction in the long term and the short term, pre-tactically or even tactically with a couple of hours uh, um, pre-notification time, 
is the main source of our planning data. Um, so we have very good tools to deal with long-term and mid-term issues such as a resectorization, adjustment of stuff, uh, reroutings even, and the coordination with aircraft operators manually or with uh, CAP or other uh, measures. And uh, finally, we put on regulations and, and then we, we are pretty sure that we have dealt with the situation. But we have very limited possibility to possibilities to deal with short-term changes, short-term traffic uh, disruptions. I mean, uh, this is uh, the main problem. One hour in advance, half an hour in advance, the traffic uh, picture changes dramatically, sometimes uh, to an uh, absurd uh, picture, which uh, has nothing to do with uh, what you planned one hour, two hours in advance. And it's very, very difficult to tackle the situation. And then it's from the planning stage in the ops room, just between the air traffic controller and FMP and supervisors, because this is where finally the situation has to, has to be solved. And um, traffic is already airborne, traffic is coming, not much you can do about this. And all possibilities that we have uh, in short term is always uh, connected with a high, uh, low, high workload. Uh, a lot of manual coordination, and this is uh, involving NM as well, us as well, and um, generating workload where we really can't, can't uh, use it, where we have no, cap no resources for this. So uh, there's the supervisor and the FMP responsible in the ops room need to see at a certain time before an event that the plan is going to work. So we need to see it. It's not good enough to, to think, okay, uh, it's happening otherwise. No, we really need to see the situation is solved. Short-term disruptions on the traffic picture were and are the main issue in normal operations, even in regulated periods. Even in regulated periods, we experience disruptions that has, have nothing to do with uh, what we originally planned for. Today, unfortunately, it is daily business that the traffic picture changes rapidly and significantly, and I'm not just looking into the, towards the summer period. I'm also, I also see this in uh, January on the 26th of uh, December, usually a quiet day. No, we have uh, very good examples where um, certain situations made life very, very difficult. And with this, it's very difficult to reliably plan ahead to, to uh, uh, adjust your staffing, to um, stick to a sector opening scheme. And uh, a very devastating um, statement is when supervisors and the FMP say, we have lost confidence in the system because things in the end, they don't work. And confidence in the system does not mean, please don't take it wrong, does not mean in the system NM and how traffic is delivered, we are very well aware that we are part of the system and disruptions in the, in the European network and the flow of European traffic are caused by us as well. Very well aware. All contributors, AOs, pilots, controllers, everybody is involved in this and we really need to solve the, the problem. So I have a couple of examples, volatile traffic prediction, unreliable regulations. Um, the, the arrow points at, probably not very good to see on the screens better, there's a light blue line which shows the regulation capacity value. There's the red line on uh, the, the uh, graph that gives the, the uh, standard, the default capacity value for this sector. And uh, for some reason, it's, thank you. For some reason, um, probably um, weather complexity or something, we went uh, below the capacity line. Uh, we expected uh, traffic um, at this line, which is about 50 flights per hour. And uh, we got over a long period of time, something about uh, 68, 69, 70 flights for a very long period. And you see all the time the regulation uh, is put on, we have more traffic than uh, we would have expected or we are prepared for. This effect is caused by traffic appearing in sectors uh, where the traffic has never been planned to be, never been planned to appear. And responsible, once again, are many reasons. There's not a, not a single cause. Um, and we know we are part of this as well. And there are other examples where this does not really work in here as well. And when you experience and when you know you, are, you probably get um, more traffic, then you expect probably you're getting more protective. This is the reason why we are uh, very often 
uh, regulate below the capacity value, not only um, complexity, but also to be prepared a little bit for what's coming on top and uh, things are coming on top regularly. The given examples all show short-term traffic shifts from a situation well within the limits of the established values and figures to difficult to absurd traffic pictures. Expecting uh, 49, getting 70, this is, uh, this is insensible, this is absurd. And um, I, I especially point this out, that this uh, are short-term traffic shifts because what I said earlier, we would like to see a solution is working very well in advance. So seeing uh, um, you, we put on a regulation and uh, we are getting 70 instead of uh, 50. We would not uh, live with this. We would call uh, our colleagues at NMOC and try to mitigate the situation. No, uh, we see that uh, the regulations, they work up to a certain time uh, uh, before the situation happens and then everything goes crazy. All of them are caused by traffic appearing sectors. They have never been planned to cross. This is my main phrase because this is, um, this is uh, an insensible thing. We have started in the beginning of the last year, we have announced this uh, to NM, to our colleagues as well, um, uh, an uh, internal sector adherence campaign. Um, there has been many, uh, there have been many um, uh, initiatives in the past decades uh, named um, uh, flight level adherence, blah, 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 days, weeks, uh, whatsoever. They have been uh, more or less uh, seriously um, lived through and then they have been forgotten. Everybody returned to normal operations to go uh, crazy in the network, but we did not have a real issue in the past years because we had some spare capacity, but now it really hits us hard. The uh, campaign that we did was accompanied by special briefings. Um, we faced the problem that air traffic controllers complained about uh, it's impossible to see level changes uh, in the system. It's impossible to see um, where an aircraft has been planned, in which sectors, um, if it's deviating from the original sector sequence. The only answer we had, and this is not a good answer, is okay, then open up some fancy text window and scroll through the uh, flight plan and all these uh, the successive messages and find out where he has been planned to. Uh, in the, imagine this in a situation where you are dealing with uh, such a uh, load of traffic, it's impossible. So we put through a high priority software change to show air traffic, uh, the, the air traffic control officers when flights deviate from the original sector sequence. So it's prominently displayed, the, the label on the screen shows the exit flight level and when it's entering uh, the wrong sector then uh, it's, uh, it's uh, displayed in, uh, in bold uh, letters and then you see, okay, something is wrong. And additionally, we um, issued a mandatory working order for, uh, to make them stick as much as possible to the original planned sector sequence. And we always point out there is no 100% solution because they say, yeah, but there is already and weather and weight and whatsoever. We said, okay, we, we know, but, but try to do what is possible, and then the situation gets better. Communication towards AOs and other ANSPs took uh, um, uh, part as uh, well, because we need uh, the uh, cooperation of the aircraft operators, and uh, we talked to, to uh, many um, of you and uh, asked you, please help us, uh, please uh, talk to your pilots, and um, because in the psychological situation where the controller communicates with the pilot, we controllers, we are trained to make everything possible. And um, when the pilot uh, is not aware that there might be some business decisions behind his flight plan because of uh, better, better wind conditions or, or um, um, ATC charges or something, and um, everybody thinks um, he uh, does a good decision for this flight, but not for the whole network. So we need uh, cooperation as well. And I must say thank you very much to everybody involved in this. We really felt a change in this. We really felt that um, when uh, people uh, filed 310 and uh, requested 370 and we said, sorry, not possible, we are not giving this to you, we had no complaint. From a certain time uh, in this year, we did not have a complaint. We have no problem from the uh, pilot community uh, concerning this. And this was a big help. Thank you very much for this. 
Sector one's adherence is not considered to be the solution to the problem, but aims at uh, eliminating a major contributing factor to the volatile prediction. And uh, we know, once again, there will be a lot of flights which can't reach their level because of uh, uh, a little uh, bit of more of fuel, which uh, uh, doesn't allow the flights to reach 370, or there is already traffic, or weather does not allow. But we tried to get our get our um, we, we tried to point uh, uh, some discrepancy that we can get a hand on. It also aims at shifting the uh, focus of the air traffic controllers from the interest of the individual pilots to the interest of airlines and the whole network, because we understood, and this is once again a, a positive thing from the intensive uh, exchange now with other with the other communities, uh, CFSPs and uh, AOs. Um, that uh, there is a very um, sophisticated process behind uh, calculating um, flight plans and uh, other factors uh, uh, come into this as well, Econo economical factors, and there is some kind of uh, business decision behind some flight plans. And uh, we try to change the focus of the air traffic control officers. It's not very, it's not uh, the most important thing to make it possible that uh, Mr. XY gets uh, flight level 370, which he likes. And therefore, we have to put on a regulation because traffic appearing in sectors, and uh, we have now to put on a regulation. And the others are getting uh, uh, disadvantages, and we disrupt the whole network. Uh, but uh, please accept that there is some meaning, some sense behind all this. Um, uh, you, as an individual, probably don't see. We try to bring the world of planning and the reality closer together, not only when the uh, CFSPs or some of the CFSPs visited Karlsruhe. We gave them a visit through the ops room, and in the end, they came out and said, what are we planning for? And this is, this is the perception for me as well. We are doing, we are very good at planning, the yearly planning, uh, day minus one, and all these things, even tactically. And then the plan is made. We go to our ops rooms, pilots go to their cockpit, and they do something. Definitely not what's uh, according to the plan. And uh, we try to bring those words together, because uh, what can you expect uh, when, when you're not sticking to a plan? It's a delicate matter, as it's a real change in the thinking of uh, the ETCOs and pilots' uh, um, uh, way of thinking, uh, behavior, but uh, we think it's worth to follow this track. I mean, it's, uh, it's not very satisfying for an air traffic controller to, to tell a pilot it's not possible, though it would be possible. I mean, just controlling a handful of flights and uh, rejecting a certain um, flight level or a certain service is, uh, is uh, not very, doesn't feel very good for an air traffic controller, but in the broad picture, probably it makes sense. It makes much more sense when it does not end at the boundary of an ANSP. This is uh, what we experienced. Um, it's, it needs to be respected in the whole network because you immediately face uh, the, the um, problem that the controllers are coming back and saying, OK, I'm putting a lot of effort into sticking to the sector sequence, but we are getting flights in all levels from everywhere, and people around us, they don't care. And uh, this uh, has a tendency to make our uh, colleagues um, um, disregard uh, this uh, scheme and in the end, the benefit that we were trying to achieve is not materializing because people just decide otherwise. To improve the efficient use of limited resources, we need to stabilize the prediction and make it more reliable, and uh, we need to do this quickly. I think this is uh, my, main, my main point I would like to make, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>